So, I'll begin by uh, sharing the screen and chanting the dedication of offerings, the three refuges, the five precepts. It's our traditional way of beginning. And a traditional way to begin a, a, every, any uh, Buddhist event. I think it's a wonderful, it's a lovely opportunity to come together as a group and to, 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 to re-establish our practice as a group. But it doesn't mean that uh, you have to do this, it's not an obligation, but it's an opportunity that's being offered if you feel like joining in. To the Blessed One, the Lord who fully attained perfect enlightenment, to the teaching which he expounded so well, and to the Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, to these, the Buddha, the Tamba, and the Sangha, we render with offerings our rightful homage. It is well for us that the Blessed One having attained liberation, still had compassion for later generations. May these simple offerings be accepted for our long-lasting benefit and for the happiness it gives us. The Lord, the perfectly enlightened and blessed one, I render homage to the Buddha, the blessed one. The teaching so completely explained by him, I bow to the Dhamma. The Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, I bow to the Sangha. Namu tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Namu tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Namu tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Buddhang saranam kachami. Tamman Saranam Gachami, Sangham Saranam Gachami, the TMP Buddhang Saranam Gachami, the TMP Tamman Saranam Gachami, the TMP Sangham Saranam Gachami, the TMP Buddhang Saranam Gachami. Tati Ampi Tamman Saranam Gachami, Tati Ampi Sangham Saranam Gachami. Panati Pata Veramani Sikabadam Samadhi Ami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. That in the Dana Veramani Sikabadang Samadhi Ami, I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kame Sumi Chachara Veramani Sikabadang Samadhi Ami, I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musavada Veramani Sikabadang Samadhi Ami. 
I undertake the precept to refrain from Sura Miriam Chapamadatana Veramani Sikavan Samadhi Ami. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Imani Pancha Sikapadani Silena Sikuting Anti Silena Boga Sampada Silena Niputing Anti Tasma Sila Visodae. These are the five precepts. Virtue is the source of happiness. Virtue is the source of true wealth. Virtue is the source of peacefulness. Therefore, let virtue be purified. Sad and sad and sad. So I'd like to invite you to assume a comfortable sitting posture. That we might begin with a meditation practice sitting. So we bring our attention into the body to notice that experience of sitting, the experience of straightening the posture. It may be that we can simply accept the way it is and notice that. It's a place to begin from. It's, uh, we don't begin our meditation when our posture is as perfect and upright just as it should be. We've, that's when we begin, but we begin right now, here and now, in the wherever it is, wherever we are. Our intention to establish an upright posture is simply so as to be awake and alert, to encourage that sustained awareness. But it doesn't mean that we, we don't begin now. We, we begin from wherever we are, however it is. Finding an upright posture, finding that point of balance, this means listening to the body, doesn't it? The mind can't do it for us. We can't just will ourselves into sitting upright. We have to uh, listen to the body. Tease out when that feels right. Noticing the muscles that support the base of the spine. Bringing our attention to how it would be necessary to, to lean forward and back 
perhaps to the sides, just to get a sense of being centered. So we can experiment by let, with letting go of the narrative story that we tell ourselves or the, the uh, inner dialogue about, have I got my posture right? If we notice that dialogue and, and let it go, then instead of establishing an upright posture based on a, a dialogue or a story or somebody in charge, somebody making this happen. We could just feel our way into the body, see if it can discover it for itself. Let the mind be still, simply experience the body. Very often, well, what happens in meditation is we bring our mental habit with us. So we're compulsively looking for what next. So instead of simply listening to the body, the body discovering that experience of being, of sitting upright. We're looking what and and next and what's next. As though sitting in itself wasn't enough. There's a what more is there than simply being aware of the body sitting. Is that isn't that what meditation is? The experience of sitting.
whatever you experience is not something we need to judge and say it should or shouldn't be. Our sensations in the body are whatever they are. Discomfort is like this, if that's what we experience. When we experience like this, experience isn't something we need to interfere with. We can notice it. When we notice it without needing to interfere, then we can observe it. We can watch it change, come to understand its true nature. The truth of our experience isn't in the stories that we make up about it, but in the direct experience of it. It's easy to have a dialogue about our experience. Make a make. It might be a, a sense of it being external, external to us. Here's the experience, and here's me experiencing it. If that's the case, then you can experiment with just letting that dialogue cease for a while, for a moment, for as long as it as long as it stops, just allow the experience to be as it is without having to be a, in charge of it or an interpreter of it, making something up about it, creating a story about it, without a narrative around it. We don't need to have the narrative to know what it is. We can know directly without a narrative. If it's discom discomfort, that feels like this. It doesn't need a narrative.
when we let go of the narrative, we let go of that create, self-creation process. We let it be as it is, be it. Dispassionately rather than as a something that I own and something created. We're looking at the human condition rather than my experience, something that's personal.
however intoxicating the mental state, however compulsive the pull of the grasping mind, it's possible to step back and notice it. It's possible to know that this is the experience. It's like this, to, to step back and not be totally lost in our mental world. Even if the only perspective we can get is this is the busy mind, then we know that's what it is. That's meditation. That's what mindfulness is, simply noticing our experience. Not judging, holding an opinion about it. When we notice with mindfulness, we can allow it to run its course. The, the busy mind feels like this. Simply noticing it's the busy mind takes us away from the content. We'll just keep noticing the busy mind and, oh, that's not so busy anymore. We can step back from this compulsive, intoxicated, grasping mind. Not through criticism, but just observation. When we do that, we're doing it out of compassion, not out of aversion.
And when we were sitting was doubt, uncertainty. I think it's a very common experience. We all experience doubt and uncertainty at times. There's so many aspects to this that are worth exploring. And we for example, a Nietzsche, which is the often translated as an impermanence, sometimes translated as uncertainty. That means that we would deliberately uh, reflect on um, uncertainty in the context of our meditation practice. So we might use that expression, are you sure, as a way of challenging ourselves. We might, uh, we might experience that in a dialogue that says, I can't bear this any longer. So then you can challenge that. You can say, are you sure? You're still sitting there a few minutes later, not sure, not sure the answer to that question. You realize that you did. And you could, and and in fact, the the discomforts passed. That's an example. The, oh, uncertainty. Yes, my I was so convinced that I needed to change my posture. But look, five minutes later, I don't need to change it anymore. Or you can experience the um, the question of uh, I need to change my posture. That, thought can come into the mind and um, if I don't change my posture I'm going to damage my knees or no that, that, that's not such a good example the best the best way of, is to say uh, my this is my uh, I'm uncomfortable I'm, I'm and if I can change my posture I'm going to be comfortable again yeah so you can say are you sure well, I'm not sure. I don't know if I change my posture whether I'll be comfortable again. I can change my posture and find out. And I might discover I am comfortable, but I might discover I'm just un as uncomfortable as I was before. So the whole thing's uncertain, isn't it? I can believe, if I want, what the mind tells me, or I can choose to challenge it and say, are you sure? And then either do or don't do whatever it is the mind says, and then uh, investigate the outcome. And we might discover, or well, invariably discover we weren't sure. For example, the, what sometimes is really underlying that uh, question, oh, if I could only change my posture, I would be comfortable forever. And of course, that can't be possible. We change our posture in no, in no time at all. We're as uncomfortable as we were before. And so we can realize, oh yeah, that's the kind of emotional, the emotion that I was bringing to this uh, to move was based on some uh, mistaken idea that there was some permanent release and freedom from suffering simply by moving. But if it is though all of my world was focused upon this simple one thing, like if I could just change my posture, everything would be perfect. 
And then you discover, well, no, uh, that was uh, nothing that isn't perfect. It didn't didn't work. And you can learn from that that your uh, that, that you understand dukkha, the truth of unsatisfactoriness. That emotionally we can buy into the idea that there's something called that per permanent happiness is possible, and that underlies that can underlie without us really noticing can underlie a, a lot of the things we do. If, if I could just win this argument, I would be happy forever. Where's that come? You know, obviously that's ridiculous, isn't it? Yet we can buy into it at the time as though the argument was so important and winning it was so important. The person that we were talking to didn't matter. It was all about winning the argument. That's all that mattered. We're arguing black is white. And, and it could be, you know, it might be grey, but that doesn't matter well, as long as we can win the argument. And then it's only afterwards the person, we discover the damage we've done to the relationship that we think, well, I don't know why I was arguing about that. It was, it was you know, that was just ridiculous. Yet at the time, in, we bought into the idea, if I could only win this idea, this argument, I would be happy forever, which is incredible. But that, when we, when we, with insight, this is the purpose of insight meditation to notice when those thoughts come into the mind, uh, we can see. Oh, yeah, that's the idea that if only I could change my past, I'd be happy forever, and it's not true. Just do it and see and discover what happens. Oh, it's like the, you know, you get an itch on the body and you, and before you know what's happened, you're scratching it. But what happened was before you got to the itch, something in your, your something inside said, if I could just scratch that itch, everything would be perfect forever. It would be perfect forever. And you scratch the itch and then you realise um, it's gone. It's a. It's like a, the itch travelled around the body, and it's somewhere else. And you go over there, and you scratch over there in that knee, and it's it's over there on the other on the arm. So I've got this itch. It's just travelling around the body, going from one place to another, and wherever I scratch, it appears somewhere else. And that's just the way the mind. You know, we, we're conditioned to think. If only I could scratch this itch now here it would go away forever but of course it, it doesn't do that because it's the nature of the body it's almost like um when we uh, you know we're listening to the sound of our next door neighbor making a loud noise and we think if only i could shut them up everything would be perfect i'd be happy forever so you go around the house, you knock on the door and you say, will you stop doing that? You're making far too much noise. You come back and then a plane comes over or somebody else in another garden starts mowing the lawn and think, oh gosh, it's like, I can't get, you know, whenever I put my finger in this hole, stop the water coming out, it comes out somewhere else. And this is, when we understand, you know, with insight, the practice of insight meditation is to get a perspective on, oh, this is just me trying to make things perfect forever. But the first noble truth is that can't be done. So a, lo a, a lot of our experience, I think all of our experience is an opportunity to, to understand, you know, the simple teaching of the Buddha, oh, this is the first noble truth. But very often we don't, we don't reflect in terms of Dhamma. We, we get caught up and carried away with the content of the mind and, the, uh, and buy into it. We buy into it, with the, invest our sense of self into it, don't we? We identify through that um, sense of self that I 
there's a, there's me here, and out there there's this irritation. And if I can fix this irritation, this me in here is going to be happy forever. But then that's the third aspect of this kind of trilogy of the three uh, insights that in the Chadukha Anatta, there's uncertainty or impermanence, not self. Un um, uncertainty, unsatisfaction is not self. Well, this not self thing, we realize this uh, that we're continually, this continual investment in trying to make the external world right comes from this sense of self inside, this me experiencing what's outside there and this will we're continually trying to get the outside world right we're, rather than looking at the inside here thinking hmm maybe the problem's back here no no the problem's always outside it's it's, it's always the neighbor the next door neighbor that's the problem or the um the, the the uh, little piece of furniture that's out of place, or the uh, something somebody's left something in on the back of the chair and it shouldn't be there. And there's always this thing on the outside. They were looking at the external world to find uh, if we could only put things right with what's outside, I would be happy forever. And there's the underlying that is this sense of I sense of this total disregard of the sense of me, because that, that doesn't matter, it's a given, not something we're ever, we don't really need to investigate this, because all we need to do is put everything, everybody else right in the world. If we can put everyone else right, then I'll be happy. Rather than thinking, what if I were to shift my position on this? If I were to loosen my grip on that, opinion and that view that I have if I would put another person first instead of this um, argument that I've got to win because when we do if we're to put other people first means lessening our attachment to this sense of self doesn't it we're actually ultimately saying every you know, there are other people in the world and ultimately we're heading in this frightening direction that um, we are one of them. <laughs> we are just one of these other pe these people out there. We are one of the people. You know, there's actually no difference between us and everyone else apart from that sense of separation that we create. We are, we think that we are the center of the universe because it feels that way but actually out there everyone you know if, if there's all these people thinking they're the center of the universe it couldn't be that way could it <laughs> how could everyone be the center of the universe just because it feels like it is for us so the possibility of getting a perspective on our our own sense of self and that having a radical transformation in the way we see the world is something that the Buddha pointed to. It's, it's not the way of the world. It's something very special, really, that the Buddha, the Buddha pointed out. Even the Buddha, when he was practicing under other teachers, they weren't pointing that out to him. They were pointing out different ways to practice, to attain something, some goal, that he would become something, somebody, perhaps somebody special in some way, some great guru. And he saw that, he saw through that as being a trap, something which was not ever going to lead to the end of suffering because that's just buying in to the sense of self, sense of separation. Being somebody more important than somebody else, better than somebody else, or more having attained some higher degree of meditative 
state than somebody else. Everything in this world is a kind of relative state, isn't it? And uh, we can compare ourselves to others. And, oh, I'm, I'm a better meditator than this person because I can sit longer than them. And when I've been practicing for long, I've been practicing for 30 years. So whatever that person's got to say isn't very important because I've been practicing for 30 years. And we can think this way, and, and that's just the self, that's the self-delusion, isn't it? So the Buddha pointed out this is the where to look, rather than looking outside and trying to get all the ducks lined up. You know, if we could just line these ducks up and get them all in a row and they wouldn't go out of place, everything would be perfect. Rather that rather than that, but to rather accept duck is the nature of ducks to be out of alignment. I can let that go. If I accept that ducks get out of line, I don't, that doesn't cause me a problem now anymore. Ducks can be however they are. They don't have to be in a line for me to be, to make everything right with the world. Now that's silly, but on the other hand, it's only an example of, it, it's worth investigating how much we invest in trying to put the trivial things right in life. You know, when ultimately they're not, they're not important, they don't matter. Nothing really matters ultimately in the world, in the external condition, in terms of external conditions. They, that doesn't mean that they can't, we can't influence them for the better, but in terms, in the sense of, does our well-being depend on them being in a particular way? Our practice is to let that go, because there's no happiness in, no joy, there's no release in, in waiting for the world to be some in one way or another before we can be happy. Even if we could get it right. It wouldn't stay that way because of the nature, because of, of, uh, of uncertainty and impermanence. So accepting that the world can't be right, can't be perfect, then that can challenge us because we can think, hey, so what is the point of all this? What's the purpose? What's the meaning of life? Because if I can't get it under control, if I can't make the world, in a sense, better, I can't, if I can't fix the world and make it happy for everyone, or even for myself, then what's the point? What's the meaning of, of life? And that's really interesting because the Buddha never expressed an opinion about the meaning of life. He didn't say, oh, you come into the world for the purpose. You know, we're, the fact that we were born, we weren't really born so that we become enlightened. It, it's a, the reality of having been born is that we have this opportunity. We didn't seek birth for the sake of getting enlightened. We sought birth so that we could out of desire to become, to be, to be, to become. If there's any explanation at all for why people come into the world, it has to be out of desire, that they, they wanted to be born, they wanted to be here. They didn't want to be born so they could not be born again, which is what enlightenment is. If we would want to be born, then we'd want to be born again, wouldn't we? So that wasn't the condition that brought us into life, into existence. And we didn't come into the world in order to be enlightened, but it's our opportunity that we've been given. So, wow, that we have this opportunity. It's an amazing opportunity. Uh, but in a, in a sense, if, the, if it's the opportunity not to be born again, then that really undermines the conventional ideas of what the meaning of life might be. Because if, if the meaning of life adds up to anything, it usually comes down to people's wanting to, con to exist and to continue to exist. 
however long it, and forever as possible, as long as possible, to try to bring, because there's a feeling that everyone experiences uh, that life's not finished yet. There's more to do. I'm not ready to die. I haven't, fi I've got more, you know, I have, I've got more to experience, more places to visit, more people. See, I'm not ready, you know. Why, why not? If we're not ready to die, why not? Because we're still attached, still trying to make sense, if you like, of the world, of our, of our lives. We haven't made, if we'd made sense of it, we wouldn't, it wouldn't matter anymore. So, as the, the Buddha doesn't explain, doesn't give us, it doesn't make sense of it for us. What he does is invite us to let go of that, that way of thinking. And I, I find that really helpful because I notice that when I'm meditating, when I'm meditating and I think, why am I experiencing this? Why is the thought coming to my head? Why, why do I think this way? Why do I want to get this, get rid of this? In a sense, the question why is a, is, a, is a kind of interesting, you know, but actually there's no, you know, it, ultimately there is no me, there is no meaning. We're asking too much. If we're going to understand the meaning, why of everything, it would be like the simile of the, the poisoned arrow where the, the person won't take the arrow out because he doesn't know what kind of poison it is or what the arrow's, made from what the shafts made from who shot it just take it out that's he took it to an end we don't need to know the reason why for everything we don't need to actually have a meaning to let go letting go is enough it doesn't have to make we don't have to make sense of everything in the world understanding according as the buddha taught isn't about making sense of everything in the world it's about just understanding the present moment experience. Doesn't it? it doesn't say, I'm going to know why I feel this way. Because if we ultimately, we'll never be able to fathom out exactly why I feel this way, however hard we try, because it's a myriad of conditions. The world's so, the, the present moment experience is made of impossible, unfathomable conditions that have caused that moment to be this way. We'll never work that out. Uh, as the Buddha explained, you can't understand cause and effect. Don't try. You'll never make, you'll never understand the causes of everything. You can understand the principle of cause and effect, but if you try to understand the causes of everything, you'll, you'll go mad. You'll never be able to do it. So our practice isn't to understand the why to everything. But just to know it the way it is, accept it as it is. It might not be the way we'd like it to be, but we don't have to blame anybody for it, or <laughs> especially ourselves, because that's ask you know asking more than is possible to understand the cause of everything. I think that's an interest. I find that very very helpful in my own meditation practice to reflect that way, that uh, when my mind gets caught up with things, I do like, you know, I'm quite interested in, in why things are the, like the way they are, but there's a, you, you, there's a it's wonderfully re refreshing to, to, to let go of this idea that I have to, everything has to have a meaning. It's a little bit like the, um, you know, when we have to find somebody to blame for everything, and you see that in me, in the so wherever you look in the news or social media, wherever, every thing, every time, all the time, uh, who's to blame? Well, actually, it's far too, it's impossible. You know, where do you stop? Because if all right, that person did something. But somebody did something to him, and then somebody did something to him. And what what were all these conditions that came together to cause to that for that moment to be as it was? 
it's impossible to know uh, exactly who's to blame. You can't, you can't do that. It's not to say that we're not, we shouldn't take responsibility for, the, for our actions, but if we get caught up in this uh, uh, judgmental way of thinking that everyone, somebody has to be to blame for everything, that's, this is no, that's um, horrible. And there's no truth in it, ultimately. You can't, there's no truth in that. That's not where truth is found. It's found in, in, in accepting that it's like this. This is the way, this is, this is what's, how things are. This is what happened in the present moment and trying to work back to all the causes of how it came into being. I realize I haven't asked you to uh, bring some questions for them. So I really appreciate it if you'd like to ask some questions and put them into the chat box for me. So I can uh, hopefully answer a few questions before it's too late, but do please fire them in and it make them brief because it doesn't, I mean, unless you're a very quick typist, it has to be brief, <laughs> but um, it's easier for me as well. Now I've got, got a, a question here. You explained about direct experience during the meditation, experiencing emotions or physical sensations, accepting without going into narratives. How do you see investigation in place and contemplation in meditation? Where I think we do use concepts and the thinking mind to come to a conclusion. For example, in death contemplation, not necessarily asking why, but understanding how things are. I think it's very interesting to reflect on what investigation is, the place of investigation and contemplation in meditation, because it can get the, we can give the impression, a, a mistaken impression, that the mind's an enemy. And, uh, you know, if we could just stop the mind, uh, that everything will be fine. And that's the, that's the object of meditation, practice. But the uh, mind is the most powerful tool that we have, is the greatest gift that we, be, we have. You know, how could it be something that's a problem or, or an obstacle? Something that should despise or, or see as an, ob, uh, an obstacle to meditation practice? You know, how could it be if it's the most powerful tool that we possess? So it's not that it's a, an enemy, but it's about how do we channel this incredible strength, this incredible tool that we have, opportunity that we have to, to reflect, to contemplate our experience. A person asking the question mentioned death contemplation, for example, which is a, a deliberate contemplation on the experience, on what it, you know, on aspect, different aspects of the, the body, um, so as to understand ultimately that we will die. And um, so there's got to be, you know, I think that the, 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 our compulsive, our minds are wasted, really. We waste our mental capacity uh, on a lot of mental proliferation, don't we? It's not like there's a the problem's not with the mind. The mind's doing what it's doing its best. I, I like to say that because 
we can, rather than thinking of the mind as an enemy, the mind's doing its best. It's, it's bringing up stuff that it thinks might be useful. And the way it works is um, if, if you, it, it likes to make connections with what went before. So if, for example, um, you, the last um, thought you had was um, lamppost, the, the next thought might be streetlight. Or it might be um, illumination. Or it might be uh, might be uh, an another thing. So it makes connections. So it follows patterns through things. If we are looking, if we want to buy a house, then we start noticing for sale signs, and we notice them everywhere. Wherever we go, we keep seeing these for sale signs. Every street we go by. When we're not interested in buying a house, we don't notice any for sale signs. You'd think. The house, could, the road could be full of them, but you don't notice them. The mind's not looking for, for sale signs. It's looking for something else. So it's conditioned by, uh, so it's not, it's not, it's doing its best. It's trying to help. <laughs> so um, the, the challenge is to channel the mind so that it does its best in a, in a, in a way that's helpful rather than that it does its best in a way that's not helping. So the amazing thing with our mindfulness practice is first to notice, to be aware uh, that we can uh, notice what the mind's doing, for one thing. Um, so it's possible to, 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 where, it, it, for, to take an example of the death contemplation, let's say you decided that for this meditation you were going to just reflect on a word, on the words of but this isn't forever. Just taking a little phrase like that, I was made it up. This isn't forever. And said that over and over. And then the mind, the mind forgot. Oh, you just remind it. Oh, that's what we're, this is what we're doing now. This is forever. And the mind will gradually ease into that repet repetitive way of thinking, keep to be bringing that object up. This isn't forever. This isn't forever. This isn't forever. Until eventually we can stop. We know that the mind's quite clear and relaxed. It isn't rushing here and there. It's quite settled. And we get a sense that I don't need to say that anymore because my mental object is established in some kind of way around this isn't forever. <laughs> and the, the, in the space, the mind will reflect. The mind's capacity to reflect, given it because it's directed, will reflect in that context of, well, no, it's not, is it? <laughs> it isn't forever, is it? Gosh no, this 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 foot's not forever, is it? No, this knee isn't either. No, well that that feeling there, that's not going to last. That's not forever. This body's not forever. So the the sense of reflective uh, capacity around about the you know, can become uh, can take our uh, become a theme in the meditation. That's that then might give us capacity to reflect in, in great, quite subtle ways around um, death, the experience of dying. And we might have a shift of, of the way we see things. Think, you know, I just took it for granted before, now it's not. And I can't take it for granted again. It isn't going to last forever, is it? It really isn't. And even, I don't even know if my next breath is going to happen. All I know is this breath. I remember that, you know, you might reflect because that's what the Buddha said. The Buddha said, all you can know is this breath. That's the only thing that's certain. You can't be sure about the next. We don't know about that. We don't know if we're going to experience another breath, all we know is this one, 
just this one breath. And that's how we can reflect. It might be like a, in the example, maybe a, a reflection around Buddha, what the Buddha said, that just remember, I just remembered it. Oh yeah, that's what the Buddha said. All we can know is one breath. We can't know the rest because he gave a, a, a sutta about that when he was asked, uh, dis- different monks were saying, oh, I, I, I can, uh, I reflect on death. I think that, uh, you know, I, I might not live tomorrow. Uh, or maybe, and somebody else would say, well, I, I reflect. I, I think, well, I don't know. I might, I might not even live till uh, this afternoon. And another one would say, oh, no, when I, when I uh, reflect, I think I might not uh, finish this meditation session. I might not live. Or whatever it was, gradually it came down. And then the Buddha said, the right understanding is, there's just this one breath. You don't know whether you'll experience the next. You can't know about that. And I thought that, that's interesting. And that's what can, that's what I mean by the capacity to reflect. It might be a memory, it might be Dhamma, it might come to mind. But we've directed the mind, we've used the, men, the, the power of the mind. Then it's not using us in a sense, not dragging us with it. <laughs> we can get that feeling, oh, oh, can't we? We're just holding on to the coattails of the mind. <laughs> yeah. But that's not, not, not to be critical because with it's really beneficial if we can just notice, oh, that's what it feels like. Because we're there then. That is the present moment of awareness. Even if we might not like it, we might not think, we can have an opinion that, well, our mind's been away with this story, this story again, the same old story. But then as long as we just accept it as it is, it's not a problem. So we're not trying to make sense of things in a conventional sense. But what we're doing is we're making sense of the human condition in a, in a sense of, we're not trying to make sense of things in a personal sense, like why have I come into the world? Well, what's going to happen to me when I die? <laughs> because that's a very personal thing. We're just looking at it. This is the human condition. I can make sense of that. I can, you know, this is the, we all, because this all we're trying to do is understand, uh, you know, like a doctor who, and when, when you go to the doctor and you say, my leg hurts, the doctor's not looking at your leg. He's looking at every leg. This is just a leg. It's not really your leg. He's not interested in your legs. It's just a leg. He sees any, if you, you, you shape, tell him, I, it hurts here. He looks at, look at looks at the place. He doesn't care. He's not thinking this is you. He's thinking, oh, this is these are the veins in the in the arm, and this is the membrane. Oh, this is the this is the bone structure. You know, it's not talking about the individual. He's not looking at the individual. He's looking at the human condition, and then he's working from that. And his diagnosis is based on. This is what it's like to have a body. This is what bodies are like. And this is your, your body's just <laughs> no different from anybody else's. And I can, I know, he, he knows that if you take this medicine, if you do this, it'll make it better. <laughs> and that's all we, that's the Buddhist teaching. He's just saying, this is the, these are the Four Noble Truths. If you, you can understand the human condition, you can, uh, you can also make it better in the sense of we can let go of our uh, wanting it to be perfect. And 
by accepting the way it is, it you know that is this a kind of perfection. It is in a way that it makes it perfect because we're not trying to make it other than the way it is. It's there's nothing we need to change. It's per, you know in a sense it's perfect as as it is. Because why wouldn't it be? Why well, who said there's anything wrong? In a sense, other than that we that story we made up the story about this is wrong i've got to put it right if i could just get this right everything would be perfect it's really about letting go of that storyline and thinking well no it's like this <laughs> this is a if you can be comfortable with it however it is it doesn't matter how it is really does it and it's really interesting looking at you on the screens because you're all somewhere different, and wherever you are, you're experiencing something that different. It's all, it all, you know, you're all in your own world, and in a sense, unique and 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 different and separate. But actually, we're all experiencing the same. We're experiencing the human condition. It's the mind body we're experiencing wherever we are. It's not really different. When we talk about sensation. We're talking about sensation. Everyone knows it's a, it's sensation. It's not, you know, pain feels, you know, can't say that my pain is different from your pain. It's the same pain. My grief is your grief. It's not different. It's just the human condition that we're experiencing. When we think that way, it brings us all together and we can see actually there is no difference, there's no separation. We, we create this idea of separation. And we, we don't need to think that way. And then we, we can, uh, there's a wonderful sense of connection with people when we don't, when we stop pushing them away <laughs> and trying to make them into somebody different than we, who we are ourselves. You know, we are actually all the same thing and then ultimately there was no difference between us so why would we create difference and and you know treat other people as though they weren't just the same as us so that's uh, i think enough for this evening I feel like us to be ready to perhaps have eat your meal or to do whatever comes next. So I'll share this chanting book. Find the closing homage. The Lord, the perfectly enlightened, said well, I render homage to the Buddha, the blessed one. The teaching, so completely explained by him, I bow to the Dhamma. The blessed one's disciple, who have practiced well, I bow to the Sangha. So thank you everyone for joining this evening. It's lovely to see you all. <laughs> and farewell. And, uh, I'll see you again whenever that is. <laughs>